but I'm waiting for the recordings to start before I continue. And then, in case you have any questions, just unmute yourself and ask. Them. Okay. Welcome everybody to the QA slash tutorial that is happening now. Uh, let me go. Is there any question we should address before we start? Any burning questions and its clarification? Um, any question regarding what you're supposed to submit today? You have uh, three submissions in in um, Google Classroom, we have the internet submission one, which is the Kafka topic. So like we need to screenshot from that. The uh, internet uh, the PDF report, which is like a form of an email, it's explaining how Kafka helps you on Spark fits into this uh, into this uh, project, and um, a link to your uh, GitHub repository that shows the project as well as issues that you have set up and then who is doing what and some posts that you might have written in terms of setting up uh, the, the topics and the rest of that. Yes, Milky? Uh, so like uh, for today's submission, uh, we are only expected to show our work plan, uh, a diagram of our workflow or pipeline and uh, the Kafka cluster, right? We're not supposed to show how, how like, when the data comes through and uh, how we process the, the data. Um, I don't think we have gotten to that stage yet. You might not have, like, in a set of things that you would use to process the data. So we just need a general overview of your understanding of the project. So that would, like, do it for the screenshot. OK. So another question that I have was, uh, uh, as as I was presenting to you yesterday, I was uh, kind of confused where I should put the validation. So, validation. yeah, like uh, if the audio and text are similar, if the provided audio is uh, what what uh, we is related to the text that we provided to the user. Okay. So you say like. Um, remove it from the Kafka cluster um, and put it somewhere uh, somewhere after the uh, after putting it on an s3 bucket like uh, using uh, an airflow to schedule the validation but yes. um, but this is not scalable scalable i don't know how i can make it uh, accessible uh, accessible every time if a person wants to actually validate it in person. If it's through um, a, a model which is already provided to us, that would be easy. But if we don't have a model, how can we schedule um, a validation per person? I don't see how that can be done. If um, you are storing all of the audio into um, S3, you, yeah. you, you, we can't we can't um, use Airflow to like say do when a person will come and um, validate that. That would be on a per person uh, basis. So we, we can probably say uh, after the the length of, of after we probably we are counting the total number of audio files that we have stored in a particular audio and particular S3 bucket. We can just say probably when it reaches like ten. And then some will come and we will, I mean, we'll have like an endpoint that will call that will read from the S3 and then displays the text as well as the audio and then use that for uh, validation. Like if it is much, then it's not scalable. But if like we still have like limited amount of audio, then we can like start with that uh, idea. I still don't know how we can like scale it such that if we have thousands of um, audio, then um, you know, user can then um, validate. But the best yeah. way would be to get a model to validate it. Yeah, that's my, that was uh, <laughs> my confusion. Yeah. Using human user to like 
validates it's a it's a tedious task. So getting a good model would just be the uh, But we don't have a good model uh, personally. I don't have a good model. So am I allowed to use someone else's model? If if that model is good enough in terms of the accuracy, yes, I think you should. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then we can also like employ probably trans uh, method of transfer learning to uh, combine model output to another model to just get a proper or good model. So to say. Okay. Um, any other questions pertaining to the submissions or Kafka, maybe? According to the uh, standard, this one it sends all of the groups, at least one member of the group has installed, has successfully installed Kafka. Uh, they successfully created a topic as well as um, created a, a producer and a consumer. So we would um, assume that the, the Kafka thing is like, Good to go and everybody's end. And um, if you go to the drive or this week, I have shared a notebook that I plan on using to explain some of the terminologies that are present in the tools that we are using for this week. If you can't hear me, just let me know. And then I'll start presenting my screen in the uh, Hello. Um, for the for the email, do are we sending you an email? Is it a document to us? Yeah. We basically want you to uh, what you would send as an email is what we want you to like type it as a PDF and then send it. Is that like you send? Uh, it's not like you're sending out an email. It's just like the content of that email is what you're supposed to like put in the PDF and send to us. That answer your question, Kate? Yeah. yeah. So, um, it's how do I say? Um, should it have like, uh, you know how when you write a letter, uh, this email address as e, is that the kind of how so much you'd want or just the PDF? It, sh it should be like a, a formal kind of email, the email that you would write to your prospective uh, employer. So it's, this, in this case, it's Ten Academy. So it will probably go like it will have that same format, only that you're not sending it to an email address, you are uploading it to a G class and a Google class. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So here you see um, explanation notebook. It's, uh, it's basically explaining uh, some key things. In, let me just bring this out. There we go. Yeah. So I believe there has been a lot of buzzwords this week. What is Kafka? What's the broker? What's the topic? How does uh, Kafka work? How are we supposed to link Kafka? as a stream, what is the function of Spark? Why do we need Hairflow? Why not just our normal run job? Um, and a whole lot of other questions, right? And that's one of the things that we would want you to uh, submit today in terms of how all of this, is, um, this fits into the project. Um, we, we want, uh, is that a question? I will not put that here. I will not that. I'm going to try and mute you. Okay, there's no need for me to do that. Okay, so uh, that's what I plan on them explaining. I believe there's going to be some questions that might originate, and then we'll be happy to. Help them. I mean, to answer them, we have uh, Kevin and then Malek to help out as well. And we have you, Case. Okay, so what is um, Kafka? Kafka is 
uh, publish subscribe based durable messaging system that uh, deals with exchanging data between processes, applications, and um, server. Um, Kafka is written in Scala and Java, and then uh, it's created by the uh, they, I mean, it's created by the, 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 the data engineers at uh, LinkedIn, I think 2016. Uh, and then the reason why we have Kafka is basically this story. They said that the data and the logs involved in today's complex system will be processed, um, be processed, analyzed, and output often in real time. So, for instance, you have a website, you want to understand the analytics who is um, clicking on this particular website, who is visiting from where are they visiting from, how many new users have you gotten, what is the uh, click-through rate, what is the conversion rate. All of these questions, you need to answer them, and then you need to answer them fast and uh, quick. You need to answer them in real time. And then because we are generating a lot of this data per second, then there's uh, uh, a need for a tool that can stream or get all of this data and produce the results on the real-time um, kind of uh, uh, level. And then that's why we have um, Apache Kafka. So um, Apache Kafka is playing a significant role in the message uh, streaming landscape. The key design principle of Kafka were formed based on the growing need for high throughput architectures that are easily scalable and provide the ability to store, process, reprocess um, streaming data. Streaming data is data that is like on t uh, like that's big data example is just big data so what is um i throughput i throughput is the is, is used for um automated equipment to rapidly produce thousands to millions of samples of um, data points for instance the, the website it's generating a lot of data on the go and uh, we need to uh, process this and that's why we have uh Kafka. so a message, uh, a messaging system sends message between processes and an application. So this is a typical workflow or typical uh, diagram that shows how uh, Kafka works. So we have an application, and then we have an Apache Kafka uh, um, uh, tool, and then it gets the uh, uh, it gets the the result. So for instance, this application is uh, is a web app or a, a, a website. And then this Apache Kafka is streaming the um, data that is generated from this. So we could say we have uh, different uh, topics. But for instance, we're going with uh, one topic as a uh, number of um, click on that particular website. That's the uh, topic. And then the topic is housed in a broker, which I'm going to be explaining uh, in a bit. And then we want to get the total number of topic. I mean, the total number of clicks, then that would be the output or we want to get the total number of new users that could be the output here and a host of um, many other questions that we wish to um, answer based on streaming uh, data so uh if i say anything and then it's not clear just uh, let me know uh, apache kafka is a uh, software where topics can be defined um so in this case topic can be a category or a table in a database. So I think we are familiar with what databases and what databases are. And we have different tables in a particular database. So we could say uh, uh, a, a topic in a Kafka is like a table in a database. Um, so it can be, uh, topics are defined here. And then applications can be added. So we can have servers, we can have endpoints, we can have and IoT devices that are streaming data, and then we can process and reprocess uh, the, 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 the data on a uh, record basis. So each of these data, they generate a particular data point, and then they serve their own purpose. And then a combination of these uh, data points called a record here will form uh, a particular solution that we like which to get out of the uh, after. So application connects to this system, and uh, this, is why I, this is what I'm working on, right? So application connects to this system and transfer a record onto the uh, topic. And uh, a record can include any kind of information, for example, information about an event that has happened on a website or an event that is supposed to trigger another uh, event. So another application can connect to the system and then process uh, or reprocess the record from a topic 
So the data is sent, I mean, the data sent is stored until a specified retention period has um, passed by. So what this line is explaining is when we, uh, when we use Kafka for streaming uh, data uh, purposes, we could have one application that, uh, that has a topic and then that topic is generates a particular um, data point and then it's, we can have another application that connects to the same uh, uh, streaming data and then that would use the um, data that this particular topic generates to answer some business questions or to process the data and put it in a particular uh, database or data warehouse. So records are byte arrays that can store working with this now. So records are byte arrays that can store any object in any format. Uh, a record has four attributes. It has a key, it has a, a value, which is a uh, mandatory, it has other attributes, and then there is a timestamp, and then there is like the header, which is uh, optional. Um, if you have created a, a Kafka topic and then you generate random data, you would um, notice that uh, we we generate this um, data and then they have uh, metadata that comes with it. And in terms of the metadata, is like the timestamp at which the data was generated, um, the other attributes that comes with the data, the, the key that uniquely identifies the data that was generated, a header file, which is like, uh, uh, like uh, a standpoint or something that's uh, uh, another part of the metadata that is being generated in the uh, uh, record bytes array. So the values can be whatever needs to be sent. For example, it could be a JSON file, it could be a plain text, or it could be agro, it could be um, uh, an audio file. In this case, if we are in our um, use case, it's going to be like an audio file, and then we, we can generally, I mean, we can basically send an audio file directly from a particular application, in this case, a particular endpoint to a, a consumer. And then we like, we need to like store it in byte arrays because that's what uh, Kafka works with. And then when we do this, we can like use, for instance, Avro to like uh, uh, convert the, uh, the audio files to an Avro. And then we can use Avro as well to decouple it and then get the audio back. And this is like the framework that we, that I would imagine people would use in, in getting the uh, audio files from the web app to the uh, S3. Okay, so that's like the basic knowledge of uh, Kafka. And then there are main points or main parts on, in a Kafka system, we have a broker. A broker is, is this a broker handles all requests from clients, which is it produces, it consumes, as well as the metadata that comes with the record that has been generated and keeps data um, replicated within the cluster. Uh, so there can be one or more brokers in the cluster. So a Kafka broker allows consumers to fetch message by topic and uh, or by partition. So a Kafka cluster, um, a Kafka cluster has exactly one um, broker that acts as the a controller. So um, basically, a, a broker handles all the process of a particular uh, Kafka cluster. And by this line, the, the Kafka cluster has exactly one broker that acts as a controller. It means that we can, uh, you know, this line says we can have more than one broker, but we can only have one leader in that particular broker. So as as we have, uh, uh, is like in a team, just as we have in this case, there is a leader and then there is like a deputy leader and then there is like uh, members, right? So if, if here as well, we have a broker and we have a lot of brokers and then we have one particular broker that serves as the um, head broker that ensures that data are replicated across the entire flow of the tough question. What this means is that if a particular broker fails, probably something happened and we can explain it, the other um, broker would continue from where a particular um, broker stops and then the entire process goes on. And this is one of the advantage and usefulness of uh, Kafka. So it's built for four, uh, four tolerance. So imagine building a Kafka topic or a Kafka cluster this week. It means that you have satisfied the requirements of job um, description that says 
building fault tolerance kind of system because you've built a particular Kafka cluster that is fault tolerant, right? So that is um, that about the broker. Now, Zookeeper. Um, again, if you have created a Kafka uh, topic, you or you have successfully installed Kafka, you would have come across what a zoo, I mean, what Zookeeper is because you need to like start a Zookeeper before you can go on and start a, a, a Kafka uh, server. So what is Zookeeper? Zookeeper is an open source Apache project. Again, Apache. Apache project that provides a centralized service for providing configuration information, naming, synchronization, and group services over large clusters in distributed system. Distributed system in this case is our uh, Kafka. Uh, the goal is to make this system easier to manage with improved, more reliable propagation of changes. So Zookeeper to Kafka keeps the state of the, uh, of the cluster. So uh, what is responsible for keeping the, the, the brokers, the topics alive, the, the, the users of that particular um, Kafka cluster is a zookeeper. I would, I would say um, if you're like familiar with uh, ZAMP and then want to start a server for, I think, PHP, then this is similar to what um, zookeeper provides to Kafka. So as ZAMP is to PHP, I would say zookeeper is to um, Kafka. So we start the zookeeper uh, server to enable ma manage the, uh, the different cluster that we might create in our uh, Kafka cluster, the different topics that we might have in our um, Kafka um, instance, the different um, users that are connected to it and the rest of that. Zookeeper enables us to manage all of this with ease and we don't necessarily have to worry about it. So we can say this is like a managed uh, service for us. Okay, and then we have a topic, this is what I'm explaining now. Topics, uh, very simplified, yeah. A topic is simply is similar to a folder in a file system and the events are the files in that folder. So basically it's a folder and then it has different events. The events are the files in the folder. So you can have a video folder and then in it you have Java tutorial, you have um, PHP tutorial, you have um, Scala tutorial. So all of these are events in the topic. An example of topic uh, name could be payments. Uh, it could be anything that you want basically. You would have seen test topic, you would have seen not test, in this case, you can say audio um, audio getter topic, or you can say audio preprocessing topic, or be creative with it. Then topics in Kafka are always uh, multi-producer and multi-subscriber. So a topic can have zero, one, or many producers that write events to it, as well as zero, one, or many um, consumers that subscribe to this um, event. So a topic, yeah, in a particular folder, you can have files, and then in a particular folder, you can you may not have any files in it. So it's just like an empty folder. It's the same thing with topics as well. So you can have either uh, many producers or zero producer, or you can have many consumers or zero uh, consumers. Topics are partitioned, meaning a, a topic is spread over a number of buckets uh, located on different um, Kafka brokers. So this distributed placement of your data is very important for um, scalability uh, because it allows clients' applications to both read and write the data from and to many brokers at the same time. So in a particular topic, we can have different uh, partitions. Uh, I think one of the uh, trainee asked the question about um, determining the number of uh, partition. It basically depends on the kind of the, the size of the data that you are expected to stream. So if you expect a large uh, number of uh, of data in terms of velocity or variety, you can in, in increase the number of um, partitions such that you'll be able to produce and uh, consume at the same time and at a smooth rate and you know, the things we just like work as it is expected to uh, work. So we can have different partitions in a, in a topic. Uh, so what are partitions? So partitions are the way that Kafka provides a scalability. Scalability to scale. Kafka topics are divided into a number of partitions which uh, contains, which contains records in an unchangeable sequence. So depend, no matter how, um, 
no matter the number of partitions that you have, if a particular data is spread across multiple partitions, the way the way it gets to a consumer, it will arrange it such that it will uh, the one. I mean, let's assume it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, and then we have like this is spread across six different um, partitions. It's um, and when the consumer wants to consume this particular. Uh, data is not going to consume six first and then consume four and then come back and consume one no it's going to consume the one the two the three then it's going to like arrange it the way that the producers like produce it no matter how uh, how spread out it might be on the uh, partition and that's one of the usefulness again of the um, after so each record in the partition is assigned and identified by its unique offset offset which is like the ID that each particular um, record has in a particular partition. A topic can also have multiple partition logs, uh, and then you, you know logs is what we generate from a particular running instance. So this allows multiple consumers to read from a topic in parallel using the log and the offset as the unique identifier for each uh, record. Uh, and uh, that is uh, that about partitions, and then we have the producer and then the consumer. Uh, producers are those clients' applications that publish uh, events to Kafka. In our case, our producer is we could have a producer from S3 that is publishing uh, uh, transcripts or transcriptions from the S3 into our web app. We can, that, that's like one producer. We can have another producer that gets the audio from the web and then streams it to an S3. We can have another producer that goes into the S3, gets the um, audio file, and then pre process it, probably with Spark and many other things that you want to use. These are the different levels of producers that we might have in our data. They are all streaming or generating data in like their own uh, ways. Go down the different data and then for answering different parts of the project. And then the consumers, consumer are those that subscribe to these events. So consumers are the ones responsible for uh, using this particular event that is being generated by these uh, producers. Um, example of the, uh, of the partition that I was explaining earlier. So this example topic has four partition, T1 to P4. Uh, two different producers, uh, producer client one, producer client two. And this is like an uh, the app and then there's like a car. Uh, two different producers clients are publishing independently from each other. Uh, new events to the topic by writing events over the network to the topic's partitions. So events with the same key generated by the uh, caller. So this is like, this is one event, this is another uh, event. This, this is like one event, another event, this another event, another event like that. Uh, the notary by the color in the figure are written to the same partition. Note that both producers can write to the same partitions um, if, if appropriate. That is, if this um, particular um, producer is for this particular topic, then they can write uh, like on a parallel basis without having to wait for this particular producer to finish writing before they can actually continue to uh, write to the uh, partition. And to read more, all of this we're getting from these three sources. So you can like go on and click and learn more about different uh, parts of uh, Africa. Uh, any questions so far? Someone raised their hand. Yes. Um, I have a question regarding producers and consumers with regard to our projects. So, producers are supposed to load files um to the Kafka cluster, right? Supposed to load files. They're supposed to like um, stream data to the Kafka cluster. Yes. Okay, so in the project, what kind of files would those be? Uh, it, it depends on how you um, streamline the, the project. So you can have a producer that, um, that gets its own data from the S3. In this case, it's getting the transcriptions 
So let's say, for instance, the transcriptions you store them in an S3, then you can have a producer that, you know, stream that data from S3 onto your front-end uh, web application. And then you can have another um, producer that will get the audio that you generate from your front-end to the S3 as well. So that's like an example of a producer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, um, not now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so my question is relatively similar to uh, Dorothy, mm -hmm. but uh, so like we have a web application or an interface for showing users a text message and to record their audio file, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after that, they will send it to the Casca. Yeah. So how do they do that? Like we provide an API for that, or how are we going to send that file? Um, that that is a logic you have to um, design um, as a as a group. But what I would like imagine is the you store all of the data in uh, S3. And, you know, it's just the normal way of doing it. But this time you just use. Kafka. So, for instance, like if you have like designed a, a, a web app um, before, and then you need to like display some information to your user, and then these informations were not hard coded, they are probably stored in a particular database. How would you read from the database to the front end um, web application? You know, you like create a connection to the database, and then you, you use a probably um, a, a p tag or an h1 tag to then display the information to the users right yeah so in this case you just use uh you just like uh instead of dis and di displaying it on the you know reading from the database and displaying directly like that we just have a, a, a kafka producer that gets the data in the s3 to the front end um, application so we are not like reading directly i mean we are not using the normal way but then we are like in, in um, including um, Kafka into it just because we want streams of data and then we are thinking we can get up to millions of uh, transcriptions and then we want this to like scale. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you. Um, any other questions regarding Kafka and its main terminology before we go on to the next um, tool? Okay, so questions. Uh, okay. Uh, we have been we are using a lot of Apache this week. I think it's it would be a good idea for us to like know what Apache actually means. I don't know what it means. I don't even know the language. Uh, so that's Apache Kafka. Now it's um, Apache Airflow. Uh, here we've had like series of questions as to. What what bit um, what part of the project is Airflow responsible for, and uh, how exactly is uh, Airflow fitting into this uh, project? I want to believe we understand why and uh, how we are using uh, Kafka in this project. So let's figure out how to use um, Airflow. Uh, Airflow it's a uh, it's a product, a tool, a technology that's uh, that is open source. Uh, yeah, Apache as well. Uh, it's an automation uh, of work. I'm sorry. Automation of work plays a key role in any industry, and it is one of the quickest ways to reach a functional efficiency. Nobody wants to like do repetitive tasks every other day. We just want to automate the entire thing and make it work for us. I and there was like a particular meme that says that uh, developers would rather spend uh, five days working on a particular automation tool than spending um, uh, probably one hour to redo the same task the next day, right? Because we just love automation. Automation gives us that flexibility of sleeping and then, uh, you know, we continue working. So that's what um, here will promise us. So let's see how we can use that. Um, Apache Hairflow is a, is a workflow engine that will easily schedule and run your complex or simple data pipelines. It will make sure that each task 
uh, each task of the data pipeline will get executed in the correct order and each task gets the required resources. So it will provide you an amazing um, user interface to monitor and fix any issues that may arise. Um, in, in the case of Kafka, we don't have like a, a managed interface. I think one of the one of the groups was suggesting a particular a managed um, Kafka uh, environment that has like that displays the kind of topics that you have, the kind of consumer producer, and how all of these things work. But we wouldn't have that in like I think Confluent maybe offers something like that. But in Hairflow, we have a local host uh, server that displays how our data pipeline is being run, um, the outputs, the, the logs, and many other things that Airflow um, generate. So Airflow is just um, an orchestration tool that allows us to schedule and run our uh, data pipelines. And then it ensures that uh, this particular uh, task is supposed to run at this particular time. And then it's supposed to, it allows us to set uh, cron jobs on a very easy basis. And then it's, uh, it ensures that uh, each task gets the required um, materials or resources to and that it needs before it actually run. And then you can like uh, set dependencies and the rest of that. Uh, the reason why Airflow is um, important is because of those problems that like uh, if we run our, uh, our uh, data pipeline before Airflow, we can, it could fail. And then retrying if um, fails is like, uh, it's uh, like a lot of work, right? And Airflow allows us to specify the number of times we want to like retry and all of these things just work and then we just relax. Um, monitoring as well, um, we have the Airflow because it allows us to like uh, monitor success or failure status of a particular task. Um, then dependencies, like uh, if a particular task is supposed to run before another task, then Airflow allows us to specify upstream or downstream um, kind of dependencies that ensures that jobs run when they are supposed to run and when uh, they would actually run and then uh, succeed. And then we have um, scalability, which is like uh, the, the major reason of scalability is like there's no centralized scheduler between uh, different cron and machines. That's like if you are trying to communicate with uh, the result of a particular uh, tool with another um, tool, we don't have like a unique a uh, uniform connector that connects all of these things together and uh, Airflow kind of um, have a way of um, solving this. And then we have the, the, the deployments, the deploying new changes constantly. Airflow, if we build a model and then we like schedule everything with um, Airflow, we can have um, conditions that it will check and then it deploys you to argue that we have um, GitHub actions that allows us to, to do this as well. But then the code is not even automated, right? We still need to like, you know, do git push before it's actually like push and then run the workload. But in uh, Apache Airflow, we can share the git push itself. And then, you know, we'll be able to like deploy our, our model, but then we, we're not using that here. Uh, then it process uh, historical uh, data. So if we have large amount of data, there was a question on uh, uh, data and um, how long we like keep data uh, yesterday during the guest talk. So Airflow kind of has a way of uh, solving that as well. Now, these are the problems that was identified and the reason why uh, Airflow was uh, created. It's just, if you look at it on a very basic level, it's just a scheduler that allows us to schedule tasks and then get the result as we wanted. Uh, components of Apache Airflow, uh, we have a DAG, which is the directed acyclic uh, graph. Um, the acyclic means no turning back uh, because it's a pipeline, right? So it's supposed to start from this point and stop at this point. That's it. Um, a, 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 a directed acyclic graph is a collection of all the tasks that you want to run, which is organized and show, I mean, which, which is organized and shows the relationship between uh, different tasks, so how it's connected, if you like uh, define a particular hair flow job for how it's connected. It is defined in a Python script, which means you don't have to go learn Java or Scala to write it. Um, that is a DAG. So it's a collection of all the tasks that you want to run. Tasks and then um, operations, they are 
um, two different things. A task is um, the, the, the execution that you want to perform. Operation is how the task will run. Okay. And then we have the web server, which, uh, which allows us to see what we have, like you know, the digital notebook that we're currently using. It allows us to monitor the status of the DAGs and triggers them and see their output and long information. We have the metadata database. Um, Airflow has its own database, which it uses to like store the logs as well as the outputs and some other configuration that you might have set up in the Airflow. So Airflow stores the status of all the tasks in the database and do all the read write operation of the workflow from there. And the default is uh, MySQL DB. And then we have the scheduler, which is like the main thing in uh, yeah, Airflow for scheduling tasks, right? As the name suggests, this component is responsible for scheduling the execution of DAX. It, re um, it retrieves and updates the status of the tasks in the database. So this is what, um, these are the main uh, components of, uh, of an Apache Airflow. And then I, th I think you should be like, be able to engage in a talk when they are, what is Airflow and how, how does it look like? As a data engineer, you like need scheduling operation a lot when you define your data. Uh, when we do set up an Airflow and then the scheduler is working, the web server is working, we need to, and um, we'll get some, uh, interface that provides us with uh, uh, that provides us with how to view our particular data plug, uh, pipeline. One of them is the DAGs view. It is the default view of the user interface. This will list down all the DAGs present in the system. When you install Airflow, you get some example DAGs that you can easily go through and then be able to set up your own uh, DAG. In this case, you're going to be writing DAG for reading from the particular this to that, transforming this to that, running this one, and all of that thing. You have to like define all of the logics and by the time you're done, you'll be appreciate, and you will appreciate what you've done. Uh, it is, uh, it lists down all the DAX presents in the system. It gives you a summarized view of the DAX, like how many times a particular DAG uh, was run successfully, how many times has failed, and then the last ex execution time. And there's some other useful links. So when you click on the DAG view, you get, and when you click on a particular DAG, you get so uh, uh, you get some other information, right? And then we have the graph view, which is uh, which allows you to visualize each and every step of your workflow. And then it has the color coding that says that this is the particular state at which this particular task is. The when we have like the deep string, this one says task is successfully completed. Tax is in progress, tax failed, of course, red is not always very good. Uh, task has been skipped, you know, failed once, and then it's retrying. This is all for retrying. And then task is in, um, is in a queue. And then no status, probably the task is just not working. And then we have the tree view, which shows um, the, just the, if you built a decision um, tree um, algorithm model before, you would see how all of these nodes connect. And then the same thing is what you would see in a, um, tree view as well. So you have like where the data are probably the, the, the start of your pipeline is uh, go to S3 and go get some data. So you have okay, the root node to be S3, um, get or whatever name you've given it, and then display to front end, probably that's another uh, task. And then you have another task that says record the audio and all of these things. So how they connect, the tree view allows you to see that. And then you have the tax duration, which is the number of uh, which which you can use to like compare the duration of your task run at different time intervals. You can optimize your algorithm and compare your performance here. So uh, when we define a DAG, we set uh, some default arguments that specifically state how this DAG is supposed to uh, run. So in a DAG, we have um, operations, and then in operations, we have uh, tasks. Operations is how this particular task will run, and then task is what actually happens, like uh, putting data in the S3. So that would be a task. Um, we we define the owner. We we specify some default um, argument, which is like the a long list here. It's just a picture to show the different um, argument that we have. I've not tried this email on failure on email on retry. My my thinking is 
if you specify the email, then it's going to like send email to, I mean, when the particular task failed, it's going to send an email to say, uh, this particular task has failed, what should I do? And all of that thing, right? And some other uh, um, parameters that you can specify in the default args um, dictionary. Then you, can, you just pass it into the DAG uh, operator when you like uh, call it. Okay, so that is like all of the information that I uh, have on EFLU. Do we have uh, any questions on uh, EFLU and how it fits into the uh, project that we're working on this week? Yes, no? Okay, so how is Airflow used with uh, Kafka? Uh, that's a good question. How is Airflow used with Kafka? Uh, my thinking is, we Kafka is we use um, Python Kafka to write Kafka codes, and then we use Python script to write uh, a DAGs in the Airflow. Which means if we write a, a, a Kafka um, a Kafka producer or a consumer or a, a, a Kafka kind of um, process, we can use that as a task and then put it in a DAG. So no, there, no there's like nothing changes there. It's just normal Python script. So a Kafka, I mean, a particular Python script in Kafka could be that uh, create this producer and let this producer send. Um, send this data to an S3, we could take that and put everything in a function and just give it a task. So if we do that and then we give it a task, then we can append it to our DAG in the Airflow and we have a Kafka in Airflow. It's just the logic. You get it? Okay, what, what, what part is still not clear? So, like, Airflow is used for scheduling tasks, yeah. if I remember correctly. Yes. Okay, so, maybe I could rephrase my questions later in the future. Okay, no problem. But the, the simple idea there is it's just um, Python codes. If you have, uh, you know, like the same, the same thing can be asked. And we could ask the same question in terms of Flask and uh, Kafka. Let's say we are using a Flask server to create our front end application, right? We can say, how is uh, Kafka used in uh, Flask? You know, you know, as we know, Flask will just help us create endpoints, and this particular endpoint is supposed to um, do something when we go to that um, endpoint. So probably when we go to that endpoint, it's supposed to create a, a, a topic and then start sending, I mean, we've created a topic and then when we go to the endpoint, it's supposed to start streaming data from that um, endpoint, right? It's still a, a Python script. We could house that as a, in, in a DAG and just schedule, I mean, and just put it as a task in that DAG and um, tell it when it's supposed to run or when we're supposed to call this function, probably when the data is in the S3 and all of that. So when you like define the logic in a better way, I'm sure you figure out how Kafka, um, Airflow, you know, everything, how it relates to one uh, one another. Okay, uh, any other questions on Airflow? So we touch on the last bit. And Airflow is pretty much uh, easy to install, just like follow a very good uh, 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 tutorial to do that, and then you can keep install Apache Airflow, I think, and then you can specify dependencies and all of that. It's not as complex as Kafka. No questions? Okay. Does that mean you understand everything? I would imagine that's like the case. Okay, and then we have um, Spark. That's a lot of information here. Um, this is another Apache product. So Apache Spark is a unified computing engine and a set of libraries for parallel data processing on computer process. As of the time of this um, writing, this is not the time, right? This, I got this from an article that I had linked up there. So as of the time of this writing, Spark is the most actively developed open source engine for this task. 
making it the de facto tool for any developer or data scientist interested in big data. So Spark supports multiple uh, widely used programming languages like that, and then it includes libraries for diverse tasks ranging from SQL to streaming and machine learning. To streaming is like the one I would like get your attention here because that's what you need. And runs anywhere from a laptop to a cluster of thousands of servers. And then this this makes it an easy system to start with and scale up to uh, big data processing on an incredibly large scale. So installing um, Spark is also not a very uh, complex task to do. Basically, we are using Spark for big data processing. We imagine that for us to, I mean, for this product to scale, we would, I mean, for this product to serve a lot of um, users and start getting billions of um, audio files. We would need a large distributed, uh, we need a system that is distributed on, on different clusters and able to process um, billions of data points at a go. And, Pandas can't do that. We have other libraries too, but they can't function the same way as Spark would uh, do the particular task. And that's why we are using Spark for transformation. So basically in, in this project, we're going to like, uh, my thinking is we're going to use uh, Spark for uh, a basic uh, transformation into the same thing that you did for for week four, week five, when you were uh, pre-processing the audio file, like when you were generating the the, the metadata, you notice like it took a lot of time. Now imagine serving um, uh, millions of users at the same time. Then that's like going to take the whole life, right? So Spark says, why don't we add a little bit of steroids into this, and so that it's instant this uh, you know the process, and that's why we are. Uh, uh, using Spark. So basically going to use Spark to, um, let's say we get a lot of audio files and then we store it in an F3. We're going to use Spark to read all of these audio files at once, because it can do that, all of them. And then we can probably use a Libusa uh, library to you know extract some features that we want out of that. If we can read it at once and at a go, then I don't think we, we are not using Libusa to read. So I, I think that that would enable us to like uh, get the information that we need on a uh, on a rapid kind of uh, well, like we we'll get it fast, right? Um, and another thing that I, I mean, another place where I see Kafka being used in this project is I mean, sorry, uh, Spark in this project is probably when we get the data from the the when we when we are reading transcript to the. Uh, front end application, we could use Spark distributing uh, distributed system to read the data, and then it's much, much faster and easier for users to use and record their audio. And then you can also figure out different ways of how you can integrate whenever you need to like process a large amount of data or you need to read a large amount of data, think Spark. Okay. So big data is uh, high volume, high velocity, and uh, or high variety information um, assets that demand uh, cost-effective, um, innovative forms of information processing that enables enhanced um, insight, decision making, and um, process automation. You notice that a lot of um, grammars go into this. So when you like writing your portfolio, you can, and then you are explaining some project that you worked on. You can you know brag about all of this high volume, high velocity, high variety, I I I things, and then uh, you know sounds cool to the um, employer such that they'll be like, wow, we really need you, you know. And yeah, that might just work. So the five weeks of uh, yeah, that's like an somewhere. Is that a question? I'm just saying. I was supposed to process a say like MFCC or MFC or sound or just I think we can just go with the later part of the suggestions, which is like um, you know, removing background noise, stripping ends and cleaning the audio part. Because we another we could have another layer of the app that does the pre processing and saving like MFCC, right? But in our in in this is a data collection speech to text kind of thing. So we're only collecting clean audio files. 
we are not like making it ready for modeling. So we can just go with removing the background noise, stripping ends, and cleaning the audio files. Okay. So the five is of the big data is the volume, velocity, variety, value, and um, veracity. And then in Spark, we have uh, the, the different um, components which is we have the programming language in spark we are we can you can write scala use a spark you can write r java or python uh if, if you know all of this uh, all of this uh, language you can decide to use it in this project um some libraries that spark offers include the spark sql the machine learning library the graph x and then the streaming which i think the streaming is one of the things that we're going to be using in this project and then we have the engine, which is a Spark core, which is responsible for the distributed system in Spark. And then we have the cluster management, which is the Adupian Apache Mesos, and then Spark uh, scheduler. I've not tried any of these out, so I don't have enough information on that. And then we have the storage, which is the HDFS. We have the um, standalone node. We have the cloud and RDA, BMS, and OSPL. What this means is that we can easily store our data to a cloud, like write it straight to an S3 using Spark, or write it straight to a new SQL, probably Cassandra or a MongoDB, or we can write it to a relational database management system like uh, Postgres or uh, MySQL. And then we have the HDFS, which I think is used by the uh, Adobe of uh, this course. And then the last bit of this is explaining uh, the Spark Core, which is the base engine for large scale parallel and distributed data processing. And then further libraries that like build on top of this for streaming, SQL, and machine learning purposes. We have the cluster management, which is responsible for managing all of the clusters that is created in the Spark. Um, we have the, uh, the Spark streaming, which is a component of Spark and is, re um, is used for uh, real time streaming data. You can link this, you can do more research on Spark Streaming and Kafka, how they relate and how you can use them to process your data. We have the Spark SQL, which is a new uh, module in Spark, which integrates relational processing with Spark Functional Programming API. It supports querying data either via SQL or via Earth query language, and then it, uh, it creates uh, a data frame or an, uh, and the data frame and the data set APIs of Spark SQL provide a higher level of abstraction for structured data, which means so kind of processing and transformation that you can do using Spark SQL is on a very big um, scale. We have the Graph X, which is a Spark API for graphs and graph parallel of computation. Thus, it extends the Spark um, RDB, which is a resilient um, uh, data and um, resilient uh, distributed uh, data, I think. And then we have the machine learning um, library, which, uh, which Spark used to perform machine learning in uh, Apache Spark, which means we can build models and uh, classification or regression. And um, I think um, uh, um, there's reinforcement learning or something. There's like a, another uh, module in the machine learning and Spark library that we can use to build uh, different machine learning uh, models. Okay. Uh, so that is uh, the that's like the short presentation that I have. So any questions? Yes, Christian. Yes. Uh, yeah. Excuse me for my question, but I, I would like to know. Uh, I understand about the, the main role of Kafka, Kafka, but I would like to know Airflow. If I want to use Airflow in our project, does that mean that Airflow is one I mean, one tools we can help me just to to make interaction between those partition because I do not really understand the the main role of airflow. Uh, if I if I get your question correctly, you're trying to like understand the major uh, use of airflow in this project. Is that it? Yes. Yes. Is that? Uh, yes, yes. Like, like I right. said, Airflow yeah, yeah, is just for, uh, is just used for um, orchestrating the entire workflow of this project. So when you define the tasks, like you draw a schematic diagram of how the project is going to be from the data oh. collection to data processing and the rest of that, you can use Airflow uh, to 
uh, sets uh, upstream or downstream like to determine when this particular task is supposed to run, uh, the kind of resources that this particular task is going to use to run, and then uh, how all of this like fits in into the uh, project. So if it's just used to like schedule the uh, task in your uh, uh, project, basically. So, uh, so uh, that's not helping to make a relation between those partition. Uh, Partitions in Kafka? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. ESP is not responsible for um, uh, setting partitions in Kafka. You set partitions while you create the topic. So while, while creating a Kafka topic, you can specify the number of uh, partitions that you want in that topic. Okay. Right. The airflow is not responsible for that. The airflow will just ensure that that, that particular um, task, which is like um, the, the topic generating a particular data stream, the airflow will ensure that it runs when you need it to run. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Elias? Okay. Thank you. Like I've installed Kafka on my computer and there is just one broker. So like when I create a topic, I don't, the replication factor is just one. So like, are we going to do just like this or what are we going to do about the replication? Uh, in, in the case of running Kafka locally, you know, it's, it's, it boils down to the processing power of the, the system. So if you have just um, one broker and then there's like no replication with just like, um, then that is just for practicing purpose, not um, a production ready kind of uh, Kafka uh, um, use or illustration. So we can use that for practicing purpose and we would um, imagine like no uh, failure would, or like um, broker won't fail and all things go smooth. But we, uh, we are working on the uh, AWS. I think it's, it's supposed to be up and running very soon. And then you should get like access to it, and then you can have. I think you have up to three different brokers, and that would enable the replication. Okay, so but for today's submission, we are just going to capture the sc screen capture out just with no replication. Yes, just like you create a topic, and then you have a consumer that is streaming from that topic. You just get a screenshot of that. Okay, the my other question is like. You've said like we can use Spark when we are providing the transcriptions to the web applications. So yeah, like, to read. yeah, go ahead. Can you clarify a little bit on that? Uh, how are we going to handle the communication right there? Uh, my my thinking behind that is like if the data is uh, you know is is uh, is residing in S three, we can use. Uh, Spark to read all of that on a on a RDD kind of uh, basis, like what Spark is based on, and we would uh, configure how I mean we we'll define the logic of how we display it to the uh, to the to the front end app. The the major reason why I'm suggesting using the Spark to read is like just to be able to like read everything at once from the um, from the S3, such that we don't have to like query the S3 every time a particular user needs a transcription, right? So if it's like in memory, but it, it might not even be useful in this case because probably we're only displaying um, one or two transcriptions to the user. So reading probably from the S3 straight is like a visible idea, but in case of um, scalability, and then we need to like display a lot of um, transcriptions to a particular user and then they record their audio, it will be better if you can you know, load it at once and then just uh, display to uh, users. Okay, like the front end application is going to be like on different system, right? Different what? Like we are going to create like maybe it's, it may be a mobile application, the front end, and it's going to be somewhere else. So like, and our server is running on AWS. So like. How are we going to handle the communication between the My question is like, are we going to take some form of API or? Uh, I didn't hear the last bit. Can you speak up? 
We have our class PhD that we want to provide to the quantum application. The quantum application is somewhere else, like maybe it's on my mobile phone. The server is on the back end. So how are we going to handle the communication between these two? Um, uh, how to handle the communication between the S3 and your your server? Is that a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, we have we have uh, an a, 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 an AWS um, Python library um, Boto3 that allows us to communicate to the uh, AWS and then we can read data using the um, Boto3. I mean we can use the uh, Boto3 to access the S3 resource on AWS and you know get the data that we need to be rendered on our app. Are we going like our mobile app? Maybe it's a web application, right? Our application yeah. will be running on the AWS server, or is it going to be running somewhere else? I mean, um, let me just jump in here. I um, so, um, your question is whether um, you can host your application on on it on the server if you want. Uh, but yeah, tell me if you want to do that so that I can allow the necessary reports for that to happen. But yeah, yeah, I mean, if if you're already on the AWS instance, then you communicating with other AWS bits will not, will, is not going to be an issue uh, since they are like sort of in the same network. Um, so if you're on the instance, you can communicate with the Kafka cluster, with the Kafka, if you're on the AWS EMR instance, then you can communicate to the Kafka cluster. And from the EML, EMR instance as well, you can communicate to the S3 bucket. So don't worry about that. That's just going to happen all in one particular place. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. So that brings us to the uh, end of the Q and A slash tutorial for, for this uh, session. Thank you very much for joining. And if any question, I mean, if you still have any other questions.